Well, last time we were together, we left off right here. I was mentioning to you that these two influences, Charles Finney on the one hand with his revivalism, and an expectation that through his own prophetic ministry, he was going to usher in what really amounted more to a kind of post-millennial scheme, a sort of golden age of the church, somewhat like the Puritans had expected. Finney's ministry was married to Miller, who expected the soon return of Christ and the establishment of this premillennial eschatology. The two of them more or less united in the thought of the third of them then, Ellen White. She had, of course, been a Millerite, but she was also influenced by the Second Great Awakening and by Finney, and the two of those more or less coalesced in her thought, and we looked at that in some detail last week. Now, I just want to add a couple of footnotes to our conversation. A character by the name of Jonas Wendell, I would be surprised if anyone's heard of him. I hadn't really heard of him until I was studying this stuff myself, but he had been a rather zealous and powerful Adventist preacher. Remember, the Adventists are the Millerites. Those two terms are more or less synonymous in that era. William Miller was not the only guy running around preaching Miller's message. He had many that were sort of his disciples and were doing a similar kind of thing, not only in the New England area, but really across the country. So Jonas Miller was an Adventist or Millerite preacher, and he'd had some powerful influence and some attention, of course. But when the great disappointment occurred, October 22nd, 1844, it, of course, hit everybody in a powerfully disappointing way, and included among them was Jonas Wendell himself. He had a great crisis of faith, a great loss of confidence, and almost abandoned ship there for a while. But as many others did, he began to go back and rethink it. Of course, Ellen G. White did that. She decided that, well, the great disappointment wasn't a great disappointment. And she adopted the sanctuary theory. This was Jesus going into the inner sanctum of heaven, not coming back to earth. We just un misunderstood it, you see. Jonas Wendell did something like that as well. He went back to Miller's thinking, but he decided Miller had made a couple of arithmetic mistakes and that he had sort of calibrated his dating based on some wrong assumptions. And so Wendell gets back on the stump, he gets back into the ministry, predicting, however, that Miller was off by 30 years, and that actually the return of Christ was going to be somewhere around 1873 or 1874, rather than the 43 or 44 that had been part of Miller's view. And so that gave him about 30 years to get back to it, you know, and so he was preaching, and again, developing a bit of a following, nothing like the original Millerite movement, but certainly he was beginning to attract some attention. He was a very persuasive and appealing public figure. Well, it so happens that in one of his meetings, this was in 1870 when he was getting a lot more attention now, one of his meetings was attended by a young man who had been raised Presbyterian, for whatever that's worth. He had, however, in his early manhood, basically decided this whole kind of Bible stuff is silly, and he'd gone off and become quite successful as a businessman, selling clothing and so on. He, he really had done very well, but he went to this meeting more or less out of curiosity. And he listened to Jonas Wendell and was just deeply affected by the message and decided that he'd been underestimating the Bible and been underestimating this whole notion of Christ returning and he became convinced of the fundamental truth of the Bible and of the soon return of Christ. And as a result of that, he sort of shifted his attention once again back to some interest in the Christian faith and some interest in getting an idea of what it means to say that Christ is going to return. Well. He joined with various others who were still part of that ongoing Adventist movement, both Seventh-day Adventist and others. There were others, of course, at work at that time. And he got together with many of them. He had many discussions. He began doing his own independent thinking and decided himself that it must be correct. Christ is going to come back, and he thought the date must be 1874. Well, as far as we know, 
Christ didn't come back in 1874, and once again, it put him and others in this quandary. Charles Taze Russell was in conversation with a fellow whose name was William Barber, B-A-R-B-O-U-R. Barber had cooked up a thought that maybe Christ did actually return, but returned invisibly. He did come back, but nobody saw him. Russell liked that. He thought that may be exactly what happened. And so he began to develop that and began to write and preach along those lines that Christ had actually returned in 1874. It was an invisible return and he found evidence for it. You can find evidence for about anything in the Bible if you try hard enough. So he began finding evidence for that, making his case, and he began publishing a monthly newsletter that he called God's Watchtower, in which he was arguing for the proposition that Christ had now returned to earth and was looking for faithful people through whom he could give his message. And so William Taze Russell began developing that ministry. A few years later, he decided that this was a 30-year period between 1874 and the actual return of Christ, which would be, is that 30 or 40 years? 40, sorry, yeah, 40 years. And the return of Christ that would be in 1914, you see. And so as he continued to do his labors, he began to focus on 1914 as the date of the actual end of the world. So Christ had returned invisibly, was giving people warning through those whom he chose as his special servants, prophets, to bring this warning to that time in history. Well, Charles Russell died in 1916, But by then, the movement that he was sponsoring had gained quite a bit of momentum, and it continued even after his departure. A later leader of the movement that was started by Charles Russell, a man named Joseph Franz, wrote of 1914 this, that that was the date when Christ's active rulership began, so Christ returned invisibly, in 74, began his active rule now in 1914. So it's not the end of the world, it is his active rule on earth. His commencing judgment then, and above all, his selecting the Watchtower organization as his official channel. When Charles Taze Russell died, the movement that he had been involved in was taken over by a guy that had been his lawyer. A fellow named Joseph Rutherford had actually defended Charles Taze Russell when he'd been the target of certain lawsuits through his career. The man's name was Joseph Rutherford, so he took over. And he he basically gave the name to this movement, the Jehovah's Witnesses, in 1931. And so that's how we know them to this day. But again, at least you can see the connections that still go back to that era of the Second Great Awakening. The other character that I'd like to highlight, just again fairly briefly, but just so we get this discussion on the table, is a fellow named Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was also a premillennialist. He was an optimistic premillennialist, meaning he believed that human history would be sort of on an upswing leading to the return of Christ. Most premillennialists are, are pessimistic. They think, you know, history is going downhill and Christ comes in a kind of rescue effort, but uh, Joseph Smith and certain others took a different view. Joseph Smith believed that the preparation for the second coming of Christ would take place through a new kind of political structure. A new political reality was going to be brought into being, a kind of forerunner of the political rule of Messiah when he eventually arrived. So that's in kind of simple terms what he was arguing for. He was born in 1805 in the New England area, right where the Second Great Awakening took place, and he was right in the middle of it as a young man. He grew up in upstate New York in the early 1800s, was deeply touched by the fiery preaching 
of the revivalism of the Second Great Awakening. That was the heart of the matter. That's where it was taking place in its most conspicuous expression. His later writings of himself says that he was really confused by the time he was about 12 years old, because by this time it had become, or was well on its way to becoming, what people later called the Burned Over District. The reason it got that nickname is because so many revivals came through that it began to spark rather bizarre and fringy forms of religious expression. Different kinds of folk religion, folk magic, and so on were all being mixed in to some sort of expression of Christian teaching. And it became rather strange, to be honest, what was going on during these years in that area. Smith himself became very interested, very taken, with the idea of that kind of religious folk magic. And he himself began to dabble in it to some degree in those early years. He states, however, when he was 16 years old that he had a vision. He says he was visited by two personages and that they told him as he was contemplating which church should he be joining, that all of these churches were off base. They were all gone out of the way and that he should avoid all of them. Then three years later, he says he received a second vision. This was in 1823, in which he was visited by an angel named Moroni. And Moroni told him that he should go out to a little district, a kind of wooded area outside of Palmyra, New York, and there he would find a set of golden tablets. And he would also find with them two seer stones, known as the Urim and the Thummim, and as he looked at the tablets through the stones, he'd be able to translate this foreign language so that he could give it to those who would be the recipients of it. He says he went out and visited the site several times, but never retrieved the tablets. He sort of cons confirmed they were there, but left them in the ground. He continued during those years to dabble in various kinds of sort of uh, superstitious, even occult behavior. He was actually sued in 1826 for fraud because he held himself out as a treasure finder. He said he had a little peep stone he could put in his cap and it would find treasure and didn't turn out to be the case. So there's actually court records about this time that reflect that. But he was nevertheless kind of becoming active in this sort of thing. In 1827, he married against the wishes of her family a woman by the name of Emma Hale, and the two of them, the year they were married, according to Smith, went out and actually retrieved these gold tablets. Over the next couple of years, they were translated. First, Emma herself would take down dictation. By the way, she was never permitted to see them. Uh, Joseph Smith was under orders that he was to keep them secreted beneath a blanket, so he would put his head under the blanket and read them and dictate, and she would take down what he was saying. Later, the translation effort and the dictation was taken over by a fellow named Oliver Rigdon, who became one of his associates. But it took about two years to translate the tablets. The tablets were then witnessed by Joseph Smith, uh, Rigdon, and one third fellow named Martin Harris, the three of them more or less working together. And once they had witnessed the translation, then the gold tablets were actually taken up into heaven. So unfortunately, they're not at the Smithsonian where we'd like to see them, but we have to take their word for it. In 1830, the translation of the gold plates were published, uh, was published as what we know of as the Book of Mormon. This included the at least preliminary uh, notion of a premillennial return of Christ. This was worked out in much greater detail in the history of this religious movement, but at the time you already see that that's generally the eschatological paradigm that is at work. Smith himself believed that he was the unique prophet in the world who was going to prepare the way, almost like a John the Baptist character, preparing the way for the second advent of Christ. The way that he was going to understand all that needed to be um, communicated would be through special revelations and visions. This was very common. We saw the same thing, of course, with Ellen G. White and many others claimed to be getting ecstatic visions, revelations, utterances, prophetic kinds of experiences, and so on. So at this point, he's not doing anything that was actually all that outside of the realm of common practice. 
However, his had a certain specificity about them. For example, one of the revelations included that, quote, there'd be a future gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of the new Jerusalem, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in western boundaries of the state of Missouri. And so we learn that Jesus was not going to rule from Jerusalem, he was going to rule from the good old U.S. of A. right here. And it was on that basis that the first Mormon temple was erected in Kirtland, Missouri. And Joseph Smith later describes that the place as it was dedicated was filled with glory, kind of like in the Old Testament, where the priest couldn't minister therein because the glory was too dense. You know, that's kind of what he described in connection with the construction of that first temple. He said this is the place where Christ would return and from which he would begin his premillennial rule over a thousand years. And Joseph Smith, of course, was the one who was preparing the way. Joseph Smith saw himself in an increasingly conspicuous role. I would say that over the next 12 to 14 years, it almost became more important who Joseph Smith was than the Christ he was anticipating. One of the more sympathetic biographers of Smith reports, this is Fawn Brody in a book entitled No Man Knows My Story. It's, a good, it's, it's probably the most widely uh, accepted and respected biography of Joseph Smith. Comments on the fact that he ran for president in 1844 and says of Smith by that time, quote, Smith was fully intoxicated with power and drunk with visions of an empire of apocalyptic glory. So he was really thrusting himself out there by this time in a rather dramatic sort of way. He didn't win the presidency, by the way, and so failing that, he decided instead to set up a council of inner circle uh, folks to have himself installed as king of the world. And so in 1844, that happened. One of that inner circle was a man, man named George Miller, who writes of that incident, quote, Joseph said to me, we will call together some of our wise men and proceed to set up the kingdom of God by organizing some of its officers. And from day to day, he called some of the brethren about him, organizing them as princes in the kingdom of God to preside over the chief cities of the nation until the number 53 were called. In this council, we ordained Joseph Smith as king on earth. And so Joseph Smith became king on earth and then shortly thereafter was shot in the streets of Nauvoo, Illinois. And that was the end of Joseph Smith. So that was in June 1844. That probably would have represented the death blow to Mormonism. Many movements, many movements were starting during this time. I'm only talking about the ones that made it, you know. Uh, and really, I think in many ways, many have thought probably the reason that Mormonism survived was because of the brilliant infrastructure genius who sort of stepped up and took over leadership, not depending on revelations, not depending on ecstatic utter utterances, just depending on raw native organizational skill, and his name was Brigham Young. And Brigham Young, of course, took at least one major faction of that movement. The Mormonism kind of split at that point. Emma Smith went off in one direction, several different, went in different directions, but the largest number stayed with Brigham Young, he took them out to the Great Salt Lake Basin, as you know, and that's the, uh, the rest of it is history, as they say. And so that was uh, what happened there. The eschatological ideas of Mormonism, in brief, that Christ would return, it would mark the beginning of the millennium, that Joseph Smith, of course, now out of the picture, ceases to be quite such a remarkable factor in that anticipation. There are four final destinies you can achieve. I'm going to skip by this a little bit because I don't want to use up my own time, but uh, you may be familiar with this. There's the celestial kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, the telestial kingdom, and then hell for the people that are really bad. Hell is not eternal. Both Ellen White and Joseph Smith and many others rejected the notion of an eternal hell and opted rather for a short period of punishment followed by annihilation. All right, so anyway, my only point in mentioning that is to say that uh, Mormonism, uh, even the Jehovah's Witnesses, a variety of other movements, of course, have their roots in this remarkable moment in American history, largely, that we call the Second Great Awakening. In England, there was a collateral movement that was clearly parallel 
over there to the Second Great Awakening. And one of the voices that came out of that movement was known as John Nelson Darby. He would be the more traditional, pessimistic premillennialist. Uh, and I say traditional in the sense that, generally speaking, premillennialism, even in the second century, had a kind of pessimistic attitude to it. He's the founder of a school of thought known as dispensationalism. He was born in Westminster, London, in 1801, so once again right at the beginning of the era that we're interested in here. He was educated at Trinity College. He was brilliant. He was never given a a theological education. That wasn't his focus or his major at the time. He was very gifted in languages, and that seems to be the area where he did the bulk of his studies, but no formal theological education. However, he was ordained as a curate, which is a little bit lower than being a priest, but nevertheless he was ordained to a ministry in the Anglican Church, the Church of England, as a curate, and that was in 1825. So as a young man, he's 24 years old, and he's appointed to a ministry in Ireland. Over the next seven years or so, I think you'd say this is the period in which John Darby has a kind of discovery slash transformation of his whole vision of what Christian teaching is about and what its content should be. While he was there as a curate, he was representing what was called the Church of Ireland, but it was actually a branch of the Anglican Church of England, but it was operating in Ireland. And he was largely doing evangelism to Roman Catholic peasants. Of course, Ireland is largely Catholic, and so his task was to win Catholic peasants to the Anglican faith under the auspices of the Church of Ireland. And he claimed to have had hundreds of converts who actually came out of the Catholic faith and joined him based on his evangelistic efforts. However, he had a very significant disillusioning uh, um, experience in uh, 1827 when the Archbishop of Dublin, who was the head of the Anglican Church in Ireland, decreed that if a person was going to join the Anglican Church, all of these, of course, who had been converted under Darby, they also had to swear allegiance to the English king, you see kind of mixing some politics into it. Darby was deeply offended by that, to require that these people, in a sense, swear loyalty to the English king, which would go to the very heart of that Irish interest in independence. You know the history there. This would not set well. And Darby himself was very offended at that and actually resigned his post as a curate of the Church of England in Ireland at that point. We don't know exactly what direction he would have gone because only shortly after he resigned his position, he was seriously injured in a horse riding accident. He fell off and uh, it took several months to recuperate. And it was during that time of recuperation that really for the first time in his life, he sat down and studied the Bible carefully. Interestingly, though he'd been a curate in the church, he'd just been going off his theological training, which was fairly modest. And that was the end of it. And he never really sat down, as many people, you know, and just read the Bible. And now he had some time on his hands, so he decided to do that. I think it's safe to say that he was reading the Bible with two different kind of ideas, however, in his head. One, disillusionment with organized religion. This whole experience with the requirement that these new converts swear allegiance to the king made him begin to wonder if institutional religion could ever quite get there. And so he became rather dis, di, disgusted, I think would be the idea, with organized institutional Christianity. He was at the same time affected by and very impressed with the Second Great Awakening. Remember, this is 1827 now, right in the middle of it especially its English expression, because there was in England at the same time a similar kind of revivalism that was going on in parts of England and in Scotland. So he's reading the Bible, but he's reading it with both of those interests in his mind, kind of percolating there and probably influencing how he's reading the Bible. One of the most notable convictions he reached early on was that the whole notion of a professional clergy was unbiblical and indeed sinful. 
So there shouldn't be paid clergy at all. This, by the way, makes him very similar to the Quakers. George Fox had taken a similar view, but he doesn't go with the Quakers. He goes in quite a different direction. He affirmed in that connection that the Holy Spirit could speak through anybody in the church. Lay people were perfectly competent to be channels of the truth of God. God could invade their person and speak and give truth for the greater good of the community and that we didn't need paid clergy to do that. So this became a highly egalitarian kind of approach to Christian practice. He joined six other men in the community where he was living who shared a kind of common vision and the seven of them met together over a period of time, several couple of years in fact, and eventually decided that they were going to start their own independent religious movement and it came to be called the Plymouth Brethren. And so the Plymouth Brethren that continue with us to this day, one of the original founders of it was uh, John Nelson Darby. As time went on, he began to think as well, however, about the eschatological ideas that were floating around in connection with the Second Great Awakening, both in England and America. And in that interest, he went to a conference in 1831 that was called the Powers Court Conference. Lady Powers Court was a wealthy English noblewoman who was deeply interested in the religious expression that was taking place in the Second Great Awakening. And she used her considerable wealth to sponsor gatherings, conferences, in which people would be invited to speak, like a Bible conference, you know. And folks would come, various people who had some reputation for having some kind of insight. She wasn't too concerned about Christian orthodoxy, so you got a lot of folks in there saying a lot of interesting things. But she just wanted to have this kind of wonderful time of preaching and hearing and so on. So anyway, Darby went. It appears this was the first time he'd gone to one of the Powers Court conferences, although that's not certain. But he certainly went to one in 1831. While he was there, he heard a guy preaching whose name was Edward Irving. Edward Irving was one of the most famous people in England and Scotland at the time. It's likely you've never heard his name, but, uh, but he was at the time very well known. He was the Charles Finney of England, a powerful revivalistic preacher, highly persuasive, very given to emotional appeals. The only difference really between Edward Irving and the English side of this and Charles Finney was that Edward Irving taught that one of the signs that would immediately precede the return of Christ would be a reinstatement of the charismatic gifts that we see in the New Testament, especially speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophetic utterances, ecstatic prophecies, this sort of thing, and they happen commonly in his meetings. So he had what we would call a kind of Pentecostal meeting going on when he would preach and they would have that kind of expression taking place. So this is Edward Irving preaching at the Powers Court Conference. In, the, in one of the presentations that he made, Edward Irving referred to an ecstatic utterance that had been given by a young woman named Margaret MacDonald just the previous year. Margaret MacDonald was probably a late, in her late teens, and she had gone into kind of an ecstatic trance in one of Edward Irving's meetings and had been in that trance for about two hours and had said all kinds of things, just this kind of, if you can imagine, a sort of prophetic, ecstatic sort of utterance. But one of the things that she had said was that as the end of the world was approaching, the church was going to be removed from the world before the great cataclysms of the end, the Battle of Armageddon and so on. The church would escape that through a rapture. Edward Irving liked that, and he picked up that and began to incorporate that into his own preaching. He didn't have a well-developed dispensational theology. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this little kernel kind of stuck in his uh, thinking, and so he was including it in his preaching. John Darby heard that, and that was really the beginning of a whole new direction for Darby in his eschatology. If you're curious, Edward Irving eventually was dismissed from the Church of Scotland, which, by the way, was Presbyterian, 
we like things decent and orderly, and Edward Irving wasn't quite uh, fitting the bill. So he was dismissed. He was defrocked, really, from his ministry there. And he uh, actually thereafter started a church called the Catholic Apostolic Church, which continues to this day. That was really one of the forerunner movements that led to modern uh, Pentecostalism. Well, this notion of a secret rapture really did capture the imagination of John Darby. The notion was fundamentally this. Things are going from bad to worse, and there's going to be a huge kind of dramatic meltdown of the social order at the end of history just before Christ returns. But before things get really bad, the church is going to be snatched out of the world. And the text in the New Testament, of course, that was alluded to was Paul in 1 Thessalonians when he says, we'll all be caught up in the air to meet Christ. And this was understood as not the second coming, but a precursor to the second coming, which would be the time the church would escape from the ravages of this time that was called the Great Tribulation. Then there'd be the establishment of the kingdom, but the, this was also uniquely Darby now. The kingdom would be established through a political state of Israel. All through church history, the assumption had been, and virtually been taken for granted, that the great prophecies about blessings for Israel in the Old Testament were really to devolve upon the church, which was the true Israel from the New Testament point of view, apparently. Paul says, the seed of Abraham are those who have faith in Christ. That seemed to be the New Testament teaching. It was pretty much taken universally to be the case until Darby. And Darby said, no, the church is going to be removed, and the state of Israel, that is the ethnic people of Israel, are going to be the ones through whom these blessings will be realized. Now, this is rather remarkable because, of course, at the time, there was no state of Israel. So that's part of what's given a lot of juice to a dispensational theory in the 20th century. But I'll leave discussion of that for a little later. The um, uh, Old Testament millennial prophecies, therefore, are referring to Israel, to ethnic Jewish people, not to Christian people. Darby, from the, that point on, for the next 30 years or so, had a remarkable worldwide ministry. He preached in Europe in the 1830s and 1840s. He became very well known. He con uh, continued to develop as he preached more and more intricate detail to this eschatological scheme that he was working out. His stated purpose for going here and there and preaching was to establish Plymouth Brethren Fellowships in Britain and across the continent. He preached in France, but most importantly, from our point of view, he came and preached in America. He was here for at least five different tours, preached throughout the country, especially, of course, in the East. He had a considerable following in America. Many people went, and of course at this point this was like new ideas that they'd never heard, and he got quite a bit of interest, some skeptics, some people almost became immediate followers. One person in particular was very important at this moment, and his name was James H. Brooks, and he just happened to be a Presbyterian pastor of the Walnut Street Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, and he decided that the sun rose and set on John Darby. This guy had the answers, and he invited him to speak at his church on multiple occasions and probably became his closest friend on the American side. Darby himself wrote extensively. He was a very good writer and a, and a polished writer and an influential kind of spokesman. He wrote tracts, pamphlets, books. He even wrote some translations of the Bible into various languages. He was gifted in languages and so on. His most important contribution, however, was a commentary on the whole Bible, not really verse by verse, but sort of broad sections and thematic treatments of the Bible from the perspective of his particular eschatological understanding. And so he wrote this rather lengthy tome which worked out his eschatology uh, really from start to finish. Darby influenced many people in America, but maybe the most important one was James Brooks himself. Brooks was a Presbyterian pastor. He loved the Lord. He was a good guy. I don't want to sound too critical of him. One of the things he did was he always had a small group of men who he would disciple. 
and he would disciple them in their early faith in Christ, and he just loved to do that. That was just something he was good at, and you know that many pastors have that kind of interest. One of the characters that came into that kind of little circle of disciples of James Brooks was a fellow by the name of Cyrus Ingersoll Schofield. He had been a, um, a lawyer, but he'd come on some very difficult times. He'd been accused of certain crimes. He had uh, had his marriage fall apart, and he kind of showed up here. Still a lawyer, bright guy, but life had been kind of hard on him. And uh, James Brooks took Schofield in. He actually, Schofield actually came to faith through the ministry of uh, Brooks, and, and Schofield became one of these disciples that was participating in uh, Brooks's ministry. Well, you know the name Schofield because uh, you've heard of the Schofield Reference Bible. Well, the Schofield Reference Bible was eventually, was eventually published by uh, C.I. Schofield. This was in the early, this was about 1918, 1919. The Schofield Reference Bible uh, became ubiquitous across the United States of America. Uh, and part of what was appealing about it was that it gave an answer to why it seemed like everything in our culture was going to hell. It gave an answer to evangelical Christians who felt they were losing all of their influence in the culture. The modernist controversy was seen to be going in favor of the modernists and against the so-called fundamentalists of the time. The Scopes trial made people that believed what they thought the Bible taught to look like idiots. Mencken, that journalist, you know, of the Baltimore Sun, he was the one that gave it the term the Scopes Monkey Trial. And anybody who disbelieved, you know, the kind of uh, the reigning evolutionary paradigm was an idiot. And that just became accepted, and fundamentalist Christians felt very beleaguered. And they thought, you know, that used to be that being a Christian was a respectable thing. And now we're feeling like we're just being shut out. And then they picked up the Schofield Reference Bible and found out, you know what? That's what happens in the end times. Things go downhill. We lose ground. We are in a, in a battle for our lives and we're ultimately going to lose except that Christ is going to come back and rescue us. And so that dispensational eschatology developed a whole lot of energy and appeal at, a very, at the very time when a lot of rather conservative evangelical Christians really needed it, you know. Well, I want to talk a little bit more next week about just how that happened. I just want to give you a little teaser as to what I want to discuss with you in greater detail next week. My Sunday school lesson for the morning, just to wrap things up. Um, you know, do you see the tension here? You see, on the one hand, uh, I'm thinking about the Christian movement in the beginning of the 1800s seemed to be coming quite institutional, quite respectable, but rather, rather mundane, having lost its energy, and in a sense, almost as a reaction against it. You have a highly emotional Christianity re reacting to it. And, and there you've got a tension that in some ways we've seen throughout church history between what you'd call a highly emotional, heart-driven Christianity and a more institutional, externalized, ritualized, respectable Christianity. And it doesn't always work out that they get along very well. Darby himself is a good case in point of a guy who sort of jumps from one to the other. As I was reflecting on this, it reminded me of a sermon I heard in, I think it was 1993, or thereabouts. I, wouldn't, I don't remember sermons all that well, you know, don't uh, be too impressed. But this happened to be the candidating sermon that was preached by a young man named David Peterson, who wound up being our pastor way back then. And uh, David Peterson preached a candidating sermon. It was on the text in which Joseph and Mary had taken the newborn baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated according to the law. They were doing what the law required. They were doing what ritual demanded. They were doing what a Jewish practice would entail. They were doing it according to the law. And then at the very moment that they are there acting according to the law, God brings into their lives these two characters, Anna and Simeon, 
who are driven into their presence by the Spirit. And David Peterson's thesis for the sermon was, we should always do what the institutions of our religion require. They are there for a good reason. They are protective for us, but we should always be prepared for the Spirit to break in in that moment of obedience and say to us something fresh and maybe unexpected, not to break the institutions, but to fill those experiences of obedience with the vitality that can only come through His Spirit. And it does seem to me that's what we need to be about. We Presbyterians like things, as I said, decently and orderly. And I think sometimes you wonder in a Presbyterian service if the Holy Spirit could do anything if he didn't ask the usher first, you know. <laughs> Would you mind if I, you know, moved here? Well, I don't know, you know. Do you have an appointment? Uh, kind of, you know, what is it? So we, we, want to be, we want to be always open to it, but we don't want to just drift off into la-la land, which is possible to become so kind of lost in a sea of confusion that we do become the burned over district. And nobody knows what, which way is up. There's a place for institution. There's a place for regularity. There's a place for decency. There's a place for orderliness. But right in the middle of that, there's a place for God's spirit to be at work in each of our hearts. So somewhere there's a balance. I hope we Presbyterians are striving to find it. This little chapter in church history made me think of it. So I hope it's helpful to you as well.